This is the ultimate off-grid solar review. We're going to be covering the different parts used, how they go together, what they will power, and all of the things you need to know, including the lessons I learned the hard way testing my off-grid system. If you don't know me, my name is Brandon. I have a brand called Solar Goat, and I am a solar panel installer. I've been designing, installing, and repairing solar panel and battery systems for over 10 years. And I would like to give you the information that I've learned so that you can better understand these systems and have a successful project. So I got on the internet and I found the cheapest, simplest off-grid solar kit I could find. It was under $500 and it came with the four necessary parts I needed to make a complete system. And those four parts is the inverter, the charge controller, the battery, and the solar panel. And once you have those four things, you simply just need to understand how to connect them together in order to make them work. And if you look at the system, really the battery is the heart of the system. With off-grid solar, nothing works without the battery. So you have the battery and the battery is going to plug into two different things. The inverter is going to plug into the battery and the charge controller is going to plug into the battery. And then the solar panels, they will plug into the charge controller. So this is pretty simple. You can just take the charge controller, you can take the inverter, you can mount them, and then you can run a positive and negative water wire from both to the battery. And then after that's done, you can uh, get a solar panel and wire that to the charge controller. It's actually, it's like surprisingly simple when you break it down um, into this. You can look at these diagrams for off-grid solar kits and there's so many different wires running all over the place. It can just be crazy complicated, but it doesn't have to be. Elon Musk has something that he says about simplicity and how you can break things down to their you know, most basic form. Let me look it up. Okay, it's called first principle thinking. Um, and basically you take complex problems and you break it down into the very fundamental, like sim most simple form, and then learn about it that way, and then build upon the complexities from there. So once I have this off-grid system set up, I wanna talk about what it will power. Um, now, the inverter is what is taking the power from the battery, DC electricity, and changing it into AC electricity, which is like usable power that you can plug something into like a normal outlet and run it. The inverter is going to have a wattage rating and any appliance that you want to run is also going to say on a label on the back of it, how many watts it uses. So it's pretty simple when you want to find out if your inverter is going to be able to run a certain appliance is just to compare those two numbers. You can see, oh, the TV uses 65 watts and I have a 700 watt inverter. I could easily run 10 TVs or, or, or whatever off of this inverter. Um, it gets a little bit trickier when you are looking at things that maybe spin um, because there are some items like say a saw that might take a ton of power to get going, but once it's going, it'll kind of level off. You'll, you'll need to take that into factor and a lot of inverters will be able to kind of surge a little bit of power for a second to get them running. And then it's also a little bit complicated when you're looking at something like electric heat that uses a ton of electricity because it might use up your battery quickly. So once you know that your inverter is rated to be able to power this item or these items, now you need to look at how long will my battery supply power to my inverter in order to power these loads. And, and if you're, you're looking at that, the term is watt hours because we're taking the wattage rating of the inverter and we're adding time to it. So how long? And, and that will be basically what the battery's rated at. How many watt hours of capacity does that battery have? That's pretty easy to look up on the specific battery that you have. Um, but for this example, I have a battery that can discharge in most situations about 600 watt hours. So if you had a, a fan that used 100 watts and you had a 600 watt hour battery, you could essentially run that fan for six hours. The next factor on this is if you have solar panels, 
What if the solar panel is charging the battery that's allowing you to use more power? That's right. But there's something interesting about solar panels. We only get about five hours of good sunlight each day that will actually take electricity, um, sunlight, turn it into electricity, and power the battery. Um, so something you need to take in consideration is we have 24 hours a day. So if you have five hours charging the battery, that five hours is going to need to produce enough electricity to run that battery for the other 19 hours that the sun isn't shining on the solar panels directly and actually charging the batteries. So you, you want to size that correctly. If you're using the full battery, you know, capacity throughout a 24 hour period or whatever, you need to understand that your solar panels are going to need to charge that battery up in like a little like four hour, five hour window in order to have that much power, if that makes sense. All right, now I want to go over what I've learned the hard way and kind of go over these parts and give you some good tips as takeaways if you're buying a system or upgrading a system or whatever. So the first one I have on my list um, is going through the products. Let's go for batteries. I would recommend buying a AGM, or a lithium iron phosphate battery. I'll try to put this in the notes, but you can write this down as well. There are a lot of different types of batteries. Um, lithium iron phosphate is the most energy dense and safest battery that I would recommend out, out there. And AGM are really safe quality batteries that are pretty affordable, but they aren't as energy dense as lithium um iron phosphate in particular so those are the two i'd recommend um something i learned the hard way about that is batteries don't like the cold they don't like to be charged or discharged or to sit out in the cold and so there are some batteries that come with heaters or like i did in my truck i added a heater and insulated it so those batteries would stay pretty warm um throughout the winter um when we're looking at charge controllers um People tend to overestimate how much electricity the solar panels will produce to charge their batteries. Um, and that could come down to a lot of different factors. But you might want more solar panels and you might want to have a charge controller that is higher quality and able to take that electricity and effectively charge the battery. Now, there are two types of charge controllers. There's, there's a PMW that is a cheap kind of an efficient way to charge a battery. It works. If, if you want something cheap and scrappy, it's it's good. You can get one for $10. But I would recommend getting a quality um, MPPT charge controller um, and then making sure to oversize that um, for whatever you know voltage or amperage it's rated for so that you can add the right amount of solar panels to charge your battery. Um, Let's see that, let's see here. Um, inverters, if you're buying a cheap inverter, um, you can harm your appliances. And if you have an inverter that's not really rated, it's kind of right at the boundary and isn't really rated to produce as much power as the appliance need, you can damage them. And so it's a good idea to buy a high quality inverter if you're running expensive devices. And it's a good idea to oversize that too so that the inverter isn't struggling and dropping voltage and doing some weird things in order to get that appliance powered, if that makes sense. Um, the next thing I wanna cover is uh, wiring. Use the correct wires for what you're wiring. These 12 volt batteries require a really thick, like thin strand, like copper wire with crimped on terminal lugs. And they do all that for a reason. So make sure that you are using a PV connector um, with the PV wire and you're crimping those on with the right tool. Make sure you're doing battery cable lugs and crimping on the connectors for your battery wires or buying all of these pre-made and, and using them is a great idea. And make sure you're using the right size wire. It's really easy to pull up some charts 
on wire sizing and everything like this, but generally um, what you're what you're going to look to do is say how many watts am I running and at what voltage and you can divide the watts by the voltage and that will give you the amperage. And then if you know the amperage, you know your fuse size and you know your wire size. It's not that complicated. For instance, if I have, let's say 1200 watts that I'm running on an inverter, and then um, I have a 12 volt battery. It's a 12 volt battery set up 1200 watts. I can say, oh, 12 times 100 equals 1200. That's, that's 100 amps. So I need 100 amp rated wire and I need a 100 amp rated fuse on that wire. So it's very important to fuse, fuse your cables um, and use the right size crimp on connectors, make sure it's all quality. It's the real world and stuff happens. If you're putting this system in your vehicle, what if your battery gets tipped over? What if something falls on it and short circuits the battery or something weird? This is like a potentially dangerous situation. And so the fuses are on the wires to make sure there isn't a surge of power traveling through that wire for whatever weird re reason, whether it's a short circuit or the jacket of the wire got uh, worn through and you have like a positive to ground or something like that. The fuse will break and the you know equipment will be protected. So make sure you do that. Um, um, another best practice a lot of people say is to connect your positive terminals first and then connect your, your negative, um, terminals and to make sure when you're like tightening things or working with things, you want to make sure that the red wire, the positive never touches any other metal and it never, ever, ever touches like the black cable. That's what's called like a short circuit. You'll get like sparks it's, you, you could ruin the battery. It could be extremely dangerous. So you gotta be careful about that. So strap down your batteries, make sure you have solid connections, make sure everything's taped up, heat shrink, insulated, just make it quality, zip ties, everything, so that situations like that don't happen and then you're using the right process. Also, never ever ever disconnect anything while it's under load. So that means if your inverter was powering something, don't take it off the battery. And if your solar panels are producing electricity to charge the battery, don't take it off the battery. You're gonna get like sparking and, and a bad situation like that where you could get hurt. So I got this system a year ago. I tested it out in my garage for a while, seeing what different things I could run. And then I ended up installing it on one of my work trucks and riding around and using it. And I've used it to power my power tools and my saws and my batteries and everything like that. And it's been extremely useful. I absolutely love solar. I love off-grid solar. The technology is awesome. And then I hope you have a good project and you know this turns out good for you and this was helpful information. If you want other videos about batteries or solar or anything like that, please check out my channel.